Hello, everybody. I am um, nice to see many of you. Um, I've worked with many of you in the past, which is very true, uh, including Dave. Um, and you will forgive me for my clunkiness. I have just hit the point in life where I realize I need to wear reading glasses, especially when material is a little far away. So forgive me for any sort of advertent clunkiness as I um, talk through the things that I want to share with you today. It is a pleasure to be with you, um, and these are topics that are and have been for many years uh, personal priorities for the work that I've been doing. Um, but before I dive into this, I want to thank Dave and his many colleagues at Intuit, who we have been working with uh, for at least three years on a variety of topics, including savings, but also student loans, uh, income-based repayment plan options. I want to thank Mikhail and her team uh, for working with us, really diving into some of the research that I'll talk about with respect to savings um, and promoting savings through tax time. I want to thank Reed, who I've been sitting up here, an old colleague of mine at New America, for hosting this event and really helping to push, um, really push us uh, inside or outside policy to just recognize how important it is that we're thinking about building the savings opportunities, not just for the short term, which is I know where a lot of us are very focused, but really making sure that we're building the savings opportunities for the long term. Uh, the gentleman who spoke up earlier, I think, made some really important comments about uh, the wealth inequality and the income inequality and how, how I think about it. I tend to focus a lot on plumbing issues. How are we making sure that we have plumbing that enables, especially our low-income families, across the country to get the opportunities to build savings and build wealth for the long term. So a few things I want to cover with you today, and apologies for others who I should be thanking, but I have um, not. Uh, the th few things that I want to talk about with you today are the work that we have been doing at the Treasury Department and what is a, frankly, one of uh, the Treasury Department's top priorities uh, this year, and it has been work that I've been involved with for a number of years, and that is really around financial access and financial inclusion. I also want to talk about some of the policy priorities that we have put into the budget, uh, focused on financial inclusion, but also building savings and long-term retirement opportunities. And then I want to talk specifically about, uh, get right into the meat of what you've been hearing a number of people uh, allude to or refer to, and that is our MyRA product. So let me start with financial inclusion. Secretary Liu has made financial inclusion one of our top priorities for 2016. We are really redoubling our efforts in this area. Uh, beginning with a conference that we co-hosted with some of you uh, who participated in this room back in December. Uh, we, through that conference that we co-hosted with some of you and as well as USAID, are really trying to use our ability to push the financial services sector to make sure that uh, millions of families have access to basic financial products and services to help them manage their day-to-day -day lives as well as to reach their aspirations for the long term for themselves and their families. With that conference, we had in leaders from government all over the globe, the private sector and nonprofits who were sharing a variety of ideas and approaches for bringing safe and affordable products and services to people all over the globe. Those recommendations are helping to inform our work in financial inclusion this year, and we do hope that they will continue to inform the work of the Treasury Department and other governments and agencies uh, going forward. The fact is financial products, whether it's a transaction account, a savings account, credit, or an investment opportunity, are really the important tools for allowing people to participate in our economy. A financially inclusive marketplace where everyone is able to access those products is critical to mobile ability, um, economic mobility. Financial inclusion facilitates human capital development. It creates small business investment, and it drives broad middle-class growth. Each of these areas is a cornerstone for a healthy and vibrant economy. Globally, there is significant commitment to expand financial access against safe and affordable products among policymakers, standard setters, the G20, as well as the many financial regulators across the globe. As such, we think there is real momentum for pushing for innovation by the public and private sector 
to develop market goods, uh, to develop and market financial products and services that can reach the needs of the millions of financially underserved. As discussed at our forum in December, we are now in a better position than ever thanks to technology, thanks to the use of data and the availability of data, as well as new business models and new entities, non-banks, um, technology companies, who frankly are helping to make real headway in our financial inclusion efforts. Technology-enabled channels like online financial access, mobile money in the global context, and these new entities who are engaging in retail financial services have the potential, we believe, to bring consumers greater access to services to better meet their needs, again, the day-to-day -day needs, as well as their long-term aspirations. I think 2016 is going to be an energizing time for this work. My office and many offices across the Treasury Department, from our Office of Terrorism Financing, when you think about access to accounts and the challenges in terms of IDs that are required to open accounts, to our International Affairs Department, are all committed to making some headway in this area. As part of our financial inclusion efforts, the administration recently proposed a set of new initiatives in the fiscal year 2017 budget. That was announced earlier this month, and you heard Congressman Serrano mention one of them. And that was our, our new fund, a $100 million fund for a new Treasury-led Financial Innovation for Working Families Fund. Building on the success that we have had with our existing innovation fund, and some of you are actually um, undertaking some of the projects that we are funding uh, with that initiative, we are looking to expand it and to encourage more private sector efforts to develop and pilot new strategies as well as new products to help families and the individuals manage those unexpected financial challenges. If appropriated, the new fund will support new financial products and strategies to better help consumers cope with unexpected income shocks, financial uh, volatility, and ultimately the need for a rainy day fund. Another important proposal uh, that was included in the budget is a $3.5 billion expansion of the Department of Labor's programs to connect young people with high quality employment opportunities. The proposal will help nearly one million young people get into their first job throughout the summer, uh, through the summer op employment opportunities, and it will help another 150,000 uh, young people who have been out of school and out of work access paid work. As part of this initiative, Treasury will coordinate with labor so the participating young people will get an account into which they can receive their paychecks without unnecessary costs associated with it, as well as with money management skills and training opportunities. We at Treasury are already working with civic leaders and local organizations, as well as national organizations, like the Cities for Financial Empowerment, to focus on youth employment and connecting young workers with safe and affordable financial products. Just last week, Acting Assistant Secretary Amias Garrity met with the LA Mayor and other local organizations that are conducting important work in this area. We also, in the budget, included a proposal we also included funding, a funding proposal to create a safe alternative uh, for small dollar credit needs. Uh, this is a $10 million proposal for a loan loss reserve fund program that will enable CDFIs to build safe and affordable small dollar credit options for the individuals that they serve. So these and other initiatives will enable Treasury and other federal agencies, we believe, to help move the needle in terms of in providing access to what are affordable and safe financial products and services. So now we're here to talk about tax time. Um, I want to talk a bit about the MyRA product, which is our relatively new product that we launched at the end of last year that is intended to be helping many of the families who we've been talking about in today's conversations access a safe, affordable, um, principal protected savings opportunity to help them begin to build savings for the long term. MyRA is an online starter retirement savings account with the flexibility that comes with being designed as a Roth IRA. 
My IRA account holders are able to begin saving for retirement. As with any Roth IRA, they can access the money they put into the account when needed, such as for emergencies and other needs, without the penalties typically associated with taking, withdrawing those types of monies from investment accounts. As you all know well, too many Americans have struggled to save, not only for the short, time, for the short term, but also for longer term retirement needs. And in fact, according to the Federal Reserve Board, 31% of non-retired Americans have no retirement savings at all. And people with inadequate savings are disproportionately younger, lower income women, and people of color. Perhaps the largest barrier to retirement savings is that tens of millions of American workers lack access to workplace-sponsored retirement plans. A recent study by Pew found that 42% of workers don't have access to a retirement plan through the workplace. The picture is even more troubling, as many of you realize, for part-time and lower-income workers. BLS reported that 63% of part-time private sector workers have no way to save for retirement through the workplace, and only 19% of those with part-time jobs actually participated in the workplace plans when they were offered. Given these challenges and the barriers to retirement savings, we have set about over the past few years to design and, and, and we have recently launched the MyRA account with an eye towards making it possible for more workers to begin saving. So I'm going to tick through some of the aspects of the MyRA, which we think, and I'm looking forward to hearing your feedback about this, uh, I've heard some of it already and looking forward to hearing more, but which we think make the MyRA especially accessible and appealing to many low and moderate income families across the country. First of all, it is simple. Individuals can enroll online in a matter of minutes. They can contribute automatically every payday from not only payroll deduction if they set that up, but also from the ability to transfer monies into the MyRA from an existing account bank account or credit union. Contributions from their paycheck, paychecks uh, can be contributed from multiple employers. So individuals who are working for multiple employers can be routing their resources or some of their earnings into the MyRA. Uh, it does not have to be tied to just one particular employer. And at tax time, they can give their MyRA account a boost by saving some or all of that tax refund. It's also safe. The MyRA balance carries no risk of losing money and the investment earns interest and is backed by the U.S. Treasury. And since MyRA is a Roth IRA, savers can withdraw their contributions without the taxes or penalties. And finally, it's affordable. There are no cost and no fees to open the MyRA, to maintain the MyRA, or to close the MyRA, or to roll it over. There are no minimum account balances or contribution requirements. And so we, we have seen individuals participating in the MyRA account contributing as little as $10 a month or $10 a paycheck. But we also know MyRA alone can't solve our nation's retirement challenges. It does provide, though, a simple, safe, and affordable way for people to start to build that savings and to build it for the long term. We also know that, that this is a hard market to tap into, and it's a hard challenge to get in front of the target individuals who we'd like to see participating in a MyRA, and that's why we think about tax time as being a really prime opportunity to convey the opportunity and the benefits of the product. We've been working to get the word out about MyRA, uh, particularly at key moments, when people have the opportunity to make a savings decision, and that is when they have resources in hand and can make that contribution to the account. And as such, we've been doing a lot of work to make MyRA a part of the tax time experience. And I want to thank you all, those of you who've been marketing uh, MyRA and sharing information about the product, especially through the VITA programs. We've been very fortunate that the Center for Social Development, Intuit, and Duke University have been collaborating with us on designing and testing ways to embed MyRA into the tax filing experience and to really try to motivate and find ways to encourage individuals to open and save in a MyRA at tax time. Over the past two years, CSD has added MyRA to its core refund to savings research. 
Mikhail and her team have designed and administered several experiments for us, which is helping us become wiser in terms of how we are marketing and driving participation in the account. CSD has added a series of retirement savings questions to their household financial survey to learn more about tax filers' perceptions and practices around saving for retirement and their interest in, and, and the individual's interest in a flexible starter account like a MIRA. Starting last fall and continuing into the current tax season, CSD and Intuit have tested messages and delivery methods for motivating filers to learn more about the MIRA, to open the account, and to direct a deposit uh, their refund or a portion of it into the account. CSD is helping Treasury testing the effectiveness of sending messages via email, and you heard Dave uh, reference uh, what matters in terms of when individuals receive emails, do they open it? And they've been t embedding information directly into testing the embedding of information directly into tax software. And we are testing the impacts of different MyRA messages to determine how to motivate tax filers. For example, we've tested messages that present MyRA as a simple, safe, and affordable and free retirement account. And we tested other messages that highlight the flexible rules that allow savers to access their MyRA savings when it's needed. And among the most interesting strategies being tested uh, encourages filers to open and save in their MyRA, and it messages around how that savings could help them become eligible for claiming the savers credit, and thus reducing their tax liability, or essentially increasing the amount of their tax refund. That research is underway now, and I am being careful not to get ahead of the research uh, team in discussing the findings. However, I can tell you the insights that we are gleaning from the CSD's research is invaluable to how we are mapping out our next steps with the MyRA product. CSD's tax time research is helping us better understand the potential for tax time funding, and it's also raising our awareness of the need for more strong research and examination of the promises and the means of marketing and driving participation in the MyRA accounts. I know many of you have suggestions and ideas for helping to make MyRA more available at tax time, and I'm looking forward to hearing those. Um, we are looking forward to continuing to work with the VITA community as well as the professional tax preparers to leverage that tax time moment to drive savings in this type of an account. So in closing, I want to stress again that Treasury is fully focused on financial inclusion, and we plan to make headway on this topic over the remainder of the administration. The President's recent budget proposals include important initiatives that we think can help to move the needle, as will our work on MyRA and retirement savings. There is no doubt about it, tax time, we all recognize this, is a powerful opportunity to help families manage their expenses, save, and build their financial assets for the long term. Opportunities such as this refund to savings event we know are critical for sharing information, learning from each other, and incorporating that into whether it's product design or policy design. So thank you all for coming together and for the sponsors for sponsoring this event. I'm happy to take a few questions and also hear some feedback about my array or other topics. Not a one. How many of you in the room have been marketing or informing others about my array at tax time? Those of you who are, thank you Gail at CFPB, very important partners to us. So I should back up. How many of you are familiar with my array? Okay. So why aren't you marketing at tax time? <laughs> no, genuinely. <laughs> Failure to communicate. I see some folks showing up with questions, so looking forward to getting them. Good afternoon. I'm Jumelia Abramson um, with the University Neighborhood Housing Program, and we are a VITA site. We've been promoting MyRA um, to tax filers and more generally to our participants in our other programs, financial coaching, workshops, um, small business owner, daycare providers. But I have a question as far as, like, 
enrolling participants mm -hmm. um, and making sure that if their employer already offers something similar, a mm -hmm. 401k or 403b, can they participate in my IRA or are there limitations with that um, and how to help them overcome those issues? Because my IRA is very simple, but then the, the product they may already have is not as simple. So we want to make sure that they can have the option of both. That's a great question, and thank you for asking it. Um, we want to make it very clear in our messages and hopefully the messages uh, that you all are conveying to individuals that participating in an employer-sponsored, employer-offered plan, which may often come with a match to those contributions, is is a real opportunity for really sort of building your long-term savings and retirement nest egg. Uh, there is no prohibition, however, for somebody who wants to open a MIRA and who already has an employer-sponsored plan to participate in the MIRA. You can participate in both, and you can imagine circumstances if somebody has the resources to contribute to both plans or both products to take advantage of the MIRA because of the flexibility that comes with a Roth structure. So for instance, when we were building out the MIRA, I have to say, are we, we still have press in the room? Because I, I really, I think it's helpful to have these conversations, but I also want to be careful about how much I offer up. Um, but when we were building out the MIRA and thinking about how we were going to market it and what was the real need and the opportunity, we talked with many large employers, and this is over the past couple of years, who have retirement plans. Those plans may or may not have been available, especially for the part-time employees or for the individuals who may be in that one-year sort of uh, employment period before they're eligible to participate in the, in the retirement plan that the employer offers. Um, what we did hear in those conversations with those employers, however, was that they were seeing a lot of their employees all the way up the income um, spectrum, basically making hardship withdrawals and taking out loans against those retirement plan opportunities. And there are real costs associated with that. So you can imagine how, if someone has the resources to continue to participate and maximize that match from the employer, but then also has the IRA opportunity, which has more flexibility, so long as you're only withdrawing your contributions, that that could be a way to essentially help to protect that longer-term retirement option for uh, people who have that opportunity. So you can participate in both, but it sounds like you are smartly being cautious about how you're coaching people to make sure they're taking advantage of the employer option. Good afternoon. So this is similar to the topic about capitalizing on that moment when the person comes in. Yeah. This is more of a, I guess, a VITA question, but on the tax-wise uh, program when we're entering things in VITA, yeah. uh, we ask them if they want to do direct deposit into an account, if they'd like to open an IRA or something like that. And Dave, I believe, mentioned in, into it being able to split your allotments of your refund into different accounts. Mm -hmm. Is Treasury maybe not uh, where you are, but in IRS looking at maybe finessing uh, tax wise in a way that we could deposit some in, uh, of the refund into their savings, some into their checking, and maybe some into something like my IRA? Great question. We have modified the instructions around Form 8888 so that my IRA is recognized in those instructions. It does not, however, get down to the specific where it, I think it says, help me here, Dave, it says savings account, doesn't say retirement account, it's just a savings or checking. You have the three different allotment options. It doesn't say my RA there, but the instructions themselves should, by the way, I haven't checked this myself, but we were working towards this uh, in the instructions explain that my RA is an option for splitting the refund. As for embedding the ability to split and making it apparent in the tax software, we are having conversations with the tax preparation industry about building in those options for essentially it would be seamless for the consumer or ideally seamless for the consumer, but their ability to open the account literally as they're filing their taxes. Um, I think this may have, you may have already spoken to it, but what would you like to see as the, what's it? 
Oh, I'm Tim Flacca from D2D Fund. Um, what's the ideal form of connection between my IRA and tax time? You know, if you had full license, is what you just described kind of where you would like it to end up, or do you have other plans at Treasury or fantasies about how it might be linked together? I think we are very excited about the opportunity to integrate my IRA into the tax filing process, and you can see how that could happen a few different ways. One is obviously the integration, as I just talked about, with the tax preparation software companies. Another would be a um, probably a longer-term venture, but a back-end system where the ability is embedded in literally the filing process administered by the IRS. But I think we will make significant headway, and I think for the consumer experience, what percentage of consumers are using professional tax pre preparers. I mean, it's 50, 60. It was about 58%. Right, exactly. <laughs> you can imagine for them the consumer experience, if we were to sufficiently cover the market in terms of commercial tax preparers, many, including those who we care about and we're talking about today, would be getting that integrated experience and frankly wouldn't know the difference whether it was an IRS integration or the commercial tax preparation integration. Okay. Well, thank you all. It's great to share what we're doing.